Uh, I'm John Osh, but uh, I really am Roger Stout, so I'm going to chair the session. I'm also the first paper in this session, something my advisor 50 years ago told me never do. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this is the topic of my presentation. It's a very simple presentation. It's about some things I've been thinking about many years, uh, and it leads up to some questions about far out future of what the city will look like. I come to two different options with entirely different kind of options about what they might be. Uh, here's the outline of the presentation. A little bit about a story I worked uh, about Charleston, South Carolina, a place I worked in the 1970s. Uh, then the Portland story, a little place down the road from here a bit, not quite the size. Oh, that's right, we aren't in the Pacific yet. <laughs> a, a, a place on the Pacific coast that'll be a little bit down the road from Vancouver when many of us get there tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> then a little shorty on the urban agglomeration story, which leads to a discussion of concepts on something I'm calling the asymptotic limit of city size. Uh, I'm not sure I like the asymptote nature, uh, nature of the topic I used here now that I know what the presentation is, but uh, we'll live with it. Talk about mega cities and mega regions. Uh, <coughs> some concept about the city being physical uh, entity versus, uh, boy, isn't that nice? Shall I take the call now? <laughs> like, like when I'm in China? Sorry. We'll see if they come back. <laughs> a lot of issues about dispersion uh, rather than mega regions as a long-term outcome into the future. Uh, also a little discussion about how ITC uh, might relate to ultimate size of cities. And then, what does all of this mean for city size, future development? <laughs> a couple of uh, preliminaries. More than half the world population is urbanized. Uh, of course, I realize after our discussions yesterday, it may be a question of what kind of, how you do the measurement and uh, how uh, different cultures might do the measurement. I will argue that city size is increasing, particularly in vertical and horizontal ways, uh, as one part of the analysis. Uh, also, uh, had a really nice discussion with Dan Griffith at San Diego a couple of weeks ago. and He said, Roger, you ought to see the map of Dallas and Fort Worth and uh, Houston they're all growing linearly together. He said, you look at it over time, they're growing together. So you're almost ready to see kind of an elbow that goes through all those cities. So that really is a nice research question about to what extent our cities growing towards each other rather than the old uh, green hut analysis where you had uh, the halfway point being the place. Like this is what you find between Tucson and uh, Phoenix, by the way, halfway between is Casa Grande, and, and as the two cities grow, Casa Grande gets bigger, and now we're starting to see some little in-betweens, the big city and Casa Grande, so it's kind of, but Dan said these cities in Texas are growing towards each other with not much in-between. Uh, <laughs> labor fields and robotics, I want to pick up on Lori's talk and uh, all the different technologies she noticed in, in a little bit as well. Uh, and rate of per interpersonal communication. And I want to have a serious discussion about that because I looked and looked for data that tried to give you some indication of how long it was taking a message <laughs> to move to a whole set of people uh, today versus how long it took 10 years ago or five years ago. I think there, the time is really collapsing, but I don't know, but I want to talk about that. And mention a little bit about corridor cities, cities and communication, and evolutionary uh, networks. First, the Charleston story. Uh, <coughs> Charleston is one of the very interesting cities in the United States because it didn't really grow between 
the end of the War of Northern Aggression, as some call in Charleston, and 1960. Literally, you'd go into the downtown area of Charleston uh, in the 60s, and the houses were pretty run down. They were magnificent, but they were old and they hadn't changed, and urban renewal had not come to the city. This all began to change in 1960 uh, <coughs> as historic preservation tools were being developed by some of the old families in the city that wanted to renew these uh, houses. And so uh, uh, Harvard University worked closely with the leadership in Charleston to develop a whole set of development tools for historic preservation. And uh, uh, by 1980, Charleston had more structures on the National Historic Record than any other city in the United States, including Boston and New York. So, <laughs> It's an interesting city in that regard. Uh, it had never had renewal, urban renewal grants, any grants from the federal government until 1977 when I moved there. That was their first year that they had urban renewal grants. And uh, just kind of interesting, they developed all of these tools for historic preservation and actually had preserved a number of the older houses without any federal funding of any sort. Well, of course, when that began to happen, it accelerated the redevelopment uh, of the city. And as you would imagine, it became a major tourism attraction center, and Charleston became the fastest growing urban center for a number of years in the United States in that period from the late 70s to uh, the 90s. <laughs> obviously growth control issue arose. I was uh, head of the urban center at the uh, college in Charleston at that time and the mayor, newly elected mayor who had arranged to get the urban development grants uh, came to me and said, look, we have a growth control issue, we want you to help us. And uh, he said, my planners uh, tell me there's a thing called carrying capacity and we want you to estimate what the carrying capacity is for the city of Charleston. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I'm willing to try and help you out, but I think carrying capacity doesn't mean a lot in humans, in many human systems. Maybe in some resource systems, but not in human system because you get tremendous spillover effects and growth will go sideways, it'll go vertical, things will be redevelopment that att attach to the spillover effects and so on. So. Here is, uh, trying to figure out which, oops. There. Uh, here is downtown part of Charleston. This is about two miles long to give you some sense of the scale. This is where all the historic preservation took place. And this the rest of the metropolitan area more or less. Cooper River, Ashley River, and people that live in the Charleston Peninsula live on the peninsula. Um, and here's a blow up of the uh, downtown area. So the desire was to control the growth in this area. Uh, about a month ago, there was a front page story on part B of USA Today about Charleston and the terrible problems they're having with growth control, still trying to manage that problem. Um, so here's a figure that, by the way, a little aside, I had technical and other assistance in my work for the last 27 years until a year ago. When, <laughs> and uh, I now have my 15-year-old grandson as my technical assistance. You can see that I couldn't figure out how to develop my software to draw my graphs. So, and he now has two jobs and goes to school. So he said, I'm too busy, I can't help. <laughs> so I drew a picture and I went around the house trying to find a ruler, but I couldn't find a ruler. So I had to use the edge of a, a paper tablet to draw the lines for the graph. Anyhow, this uh, uh, curve tries to capture what happened, you know, just a little bit of uh, bouncing along here until about 1960, and then this preservation took off, and then it probably ought to be a little steeper curve here to capture. It was something like this. So uh, what do we have here? Well, if we take a lot of uh, uh, 
growth theory and so on, uh, and technology eras and so on, you get kind of an S-shaped curve that you expect to occur. And uh, now, that curve, if it goes to fruit, it takes the form of a logistic. Problem with the logistic for forecasting what the carrying capacity is, is that this part is the reverse symmetry of that part. The reality of what happens can be anything. This is borrowed from a cluster study I did a few years ago. Uh, you have this kind of process that unfolds and you have all kinds of things that can happen along the way. So you can't use this as a way to predict what the outcome could be, which would be a way to predict short-term carrying capacity. Um, here are a whole bunch of other ways that the outcomes might occur. You know, mining communities that are not well developed, they're all dependent on the mine. The uh, uh, load plays out, world uh, economy changes, and you can get this happening, ghost city. Uh, you can also have a learning experience where you have this and then you have different plateaus that are reached, but the process continues. You might say that's a rejuvenation in a way, but that if you take the Charleston experience to uh, 2015, it's exactly what happened in Charleston. It's still growing. Uh, then you also have other things you might argue are non-learning clusters. They learn for a while and then they collapse to some point. Uh, then you can have cases where you get a collapse and then you have a recovery. <coughs> you take the uh, city of Liverpool in England and you look at 200 years history and Liverpool started declining in, in the latter part of the 19th century and each time that it declined Instead of recovering, it went a little further down, a little further down as port technology changed, other circumstances changed. And it was in a book that I wrote on regional uh, leadership. And uh, it was the example that I used on how uh, this kind of process can unfold. The lack of a leadership model taking on when you hit this recovery point. Um, <laughs> I was giving a presentation on Paris on this, and a woman in the back of the room is back there just waving her hand when I'm talking about Liverpool. She said, oh, Dr. Stow, I was just in Liverpool last week, and the whole downtown area is being rebuilt. Big buildings are going up. Parks are being built, and so on. And I said, gee, well, it turns out uh, it was a lagging region when the regional policy in the EU was very powerful and there was a lot of money in it. And between uh, the EU and, and England or Great Britain, uh, a lot of money was poured in. So instead of having a leadership success story, you actually had an, a flow of a lot of resources in which actually ignited the leadership and then things began to happen. Well, anyhow, it's a bit of an aside, but uh, and then uh, you have a case where you get a takeoff and you got this process growing and it all falls apart. And here I called it the premature failure of a cluster uh, region. Region is fine. Um, so what do you conclude from the Charleston story? Difficult to constrain growth, difficult to control spread effects, difficult to predict the growth curve, and these conclusions apply to a lot of other cities in the world that grow. They try to uh, constrain growth, but being able to legislate the growth controls and to enforce them, very difficult, despite the nice story that Peter gave us about Calcutta yesterday and how the slums are much less uh, uh, ex expansive there than they are in, in uh, Mumbai and other places. All right, now let's go to the Portland. Portland, Oregon, uh, most often cited region in the United States that's adopted a growth control boundary back in the 80s uh, to control spread effects and to manage sprawl. Tool of smart growth movement. Uh, experience has been mixed, but success has been limited. 
growth leapfrog frogging boundary as you'll see on the map we're going to talk about in a minute. An initial boundary was put in place and then people began to leapfrog across the boundary as it, uh, development got more intense in the area to outlying towns which then involved setting another boundary and then now there's other little places beyond. And here's the map for this. Here you see the original boundary. You see a bunch of little spots that became development, moved the boundary way out, and then across the river into Vancouver, which is also the Vancouver and Oregon. Uh, this eventually is getting is in process of being adopted now. So, and here you have another area pushing the growth boundary out. Now, there have been all kinds of uh, policy issues associated with this. There have been uh, big issues of, uh, of uh, how to enforce this. And even though enforcement's been fairly good, this leapfrogging is just it shows human ingenuity in getting around the, the boundary. So again, I conclude it's difficult to constrain the spread effects of urban development even with a growth boundary, despite the fact that some parts of Europe this works very nicely, like in Sweden and Switzerland in particular, and leapfrogging is one of the vehicles. Now, the urban agglomeration study, uh, there are positive forces which I've listed there. Some of them you might take issue with. I got those out of a book from somebody, I think Ed Glazer, as a matter of fact. So, so uh, uh, but despite those, these pressures, environment, land prices, corruption, et cetera, and so on, uh, growth continues uh, in these areas. Now, why is that? The, uh, here's a simple little model of urban agglomeration, which uh, uh, seems to be the underlying dynamic growing force of the continuation of urbanization spreading. Actually, the real causes people's preferences for a certain kind of living. Uh, so you have a cluster of economies that give you scale economies in a urban region, uh, successful of course, in migration of workers take advantage of the opportunities. This brings diversity uh, in the nature of the workers and demand which creates new ideas, innovation, knowledge, which in turn refuels the clustering. So you have this positive reinforcing system. It's been going on uh, quite a while uh, in the history of uh, development and it's likely to continue for a long time. Now you might say, well, yes, but if we go back and say, well, if these forces get strong enough, they're going to violate the positive reinforcement uh, cycle that's unfolding. But the process continues and uh, has been, and now we see the rise of mega cities, the rise of mega urban or mega city regions, and getting bigger and bigger in both in the developed countries and the developing countries, which is even at a faster rate. Okay, so what are the limits of urban growth? Now, positive reinforcement model applies continuous growth. What's the limit of its continuous growth? Well, in certain kinds of circumstances, we might say one big city, like the one that uh, uh, Tigran put up with all the, the pirouettes and, and the things in it this morning. You can just think of a vast city where the people are living and communicating both face to face in some cases, but also uh, quite uh, indirectly with their uh, IT technology. Uh, many mega cities might be another landscape or mega urban regions or maybe a distributed city, which I don't mention here, a more distributed urban. Uh, so urban size and growth curve viewed as a negative exponential today. We have, uh, if you have percent of population on the vertical axis, oh, let me just go to the slide, it'd be easier to, uh, to do this. Here we go. Here's again one of my uh, uh, self-styled uh, graphs. Today, 50% or so going down to what I'm calling medium large cities here, which consumes the 100% mark. 
the future not too far out, changing in this way, way out, a very small percentage of small villages, and increasingly as we get several mega cities that you might envision in the world, you get very high level of uh, population living in these cities. So, uh, uh, okay, I'm just explaining the curve and we saw the next slide, all right. Uh, now, mega cities, experience to date, near term going forward. Uh, we all know the term mega cities, uh, uh, mega region, urban regions. Uh, they keep growing in size and number with limited ability, it seems to constrain growth and geographic spread effects or vertical effects for that matter. You find cases in the U.S. Northeast Corridor, Europe, South Asia, all having emerging mega regions. Uh, issues going forward, a lot of questions about governance and, and growth boundaries and how to enforce them and so on, public policy issues, public management and so on, all related to a vision of a few uh, large-scale uh, urban mega regions that might be out on the high end of that last curve that we looked at. Uh, here is China, mega regions that have been identified there. Most of my work has been in this one, which is the Pearl River Delta, but also the Yangtze Delta and other places you've heard of. Uh, here's just another map of the same phenomena. Here's the Pearl River Delta mega region also. Very special mega region because they've recently developed a tremendous capacity for self-innovation, something China's been trying to develop uh, since 1979 with coming out. And so it's very interesting, but it's a side story and I won't go into that. Let's talk about some discussions and conclusions. City size will most likely, if we look at experience so far, continue to increase into a dominant form of large mega urban regions, uh, like the ones we've just pointed to in China, but we could have used other parts of the world. Uh, there will continue to be governance and boundary issues, particularly this enforcement variable is a very difficult one. Even if we have strong enforcement, it's very difficult to enforce well enough that human ingenuity can't get around it and continue to induce spread effects. Uh, there are management issues, uh, all kinds of things with water supply, and uh, various kinds of infrastructure support, and so on. But there probably is an alternative argument you could make about the future. Uh, maybe it isn't going to be that way. Maybe it's going to be a not so many large mega cities, a much more distributed uh, urban landscape. ICT moving toward an asymptotic community, much like the world of the Borg people. I don't know how many have ever heard of the Borg people. It's a TV show. Borg people are mixtures of uh, mechanical and technological uh, bolt-on structures to humans, so they're a combination human form and machine form. Uh, they have the unique attribute of one Borg saying something or communicating something. All the other Borg people receive it at the same time and process it, so everybody communicates with everyone instantaneously. And I would argue that's the asymptotic limit of what we've seen, this whole issue of the rate at which messages distribute in a community getting shorter and shorter. What's the limit? Like, what's the limit of city? One city in the world, uh, everybody communicating with everybody at the same time. Uh, I can't imagine that, but uh, uh, that would be an asymptote. Uh, adding robotics, printing and others in, uh, you even add additional functionality to that reality. Uh, what is a city? Is it a microcosm, the unit city, or more of a way of life? Can you decompose the city into different parts uh, in these larger mega regions if that's where we end up? Uh, so I think you can make an argument for quite an alternative outcome if you have enough knowledge about the different technologies that we now have evolving, not just IT and, and computer technology, but other 
kinds of things that Lori's talked about. And, you know, it might be an interesting research topic to try and go through those different technology areas that are evolving, Lori, and try and understand what are the potentials for com substituting communication for travel or for living in a community for face-to-face -face and so on. So I think the, f the final questions here are, is the future going to be one where uh, the substitution of communication for uh, travel and being located um, dominates? If that's the case, then you're likely to have uh, uh, large mega cities evolving. And if, alternatively, you might have a complementarity, oh, pardon me, I reversed it. So uh, uh, if you have a lot of substitution effect, uh, you are likely to have uh, a much larger spread, a much larger urban landscape than if you get a complementary effect. Uh, I think maybe I reversed them again, but the point is, one, you end up with very concentration and the other with less. It's very similar to the impact that uh, uh, we've had from communication technology related to transport, where one of the arguments was you're going to get uh, a lot more con congestion, and other arguments are, well, when you have it, you, you'll actually disseminate and trade, and you, you'll get a, a, a substitution effect, not a complementary effect with one of them. So, uh, how am I doing with time? Uh, you've got five minutes over your extra seven minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. Very enlightening, giving us uh, a way of understanding different models of, of growth, uh, different trajectories. One thing that's come to mind recently, and this is from a lot of work I've been doing in, in the developing world as well, is you're seeing the growth of cities is happening so fast. It's outstripping the capacity of local governments to deliver uh, housing, transportation, these sorts of issues. Um, so one aspect, of course, is planning for growth and, and planning for ways of managing that growth. The other aspect could be potentially more macro level nationwide. And I know in the afternoon we're going to hear from about national urban policies, and mm -hmm. this is a potential. But having uh, directing growth in different, uh, a more equally distributed way, uh, attracting people to different sized cities. You started to allude to that at the end, so I would yeah. like to hear some further reflections, if you don't mind. Do you, okay. Take my, my this question as well, and maybe then Roger can come to okay. both of them together. It's that if you look at the rank size distribution over the last 50 years, it's extremely stable. And of course, it's increasing outwards as the world population grows, more and more people move to cities. And from the uh, JRC database that I mentioned yesterday, um, the Joint Research Council's database looks at urban agglomerations. And um, uh, it says that, that uh, the number of urban agglomerations over 50,000 is, is 13,844, 13, it says, basically. Yes. Now, from that, you can work, and we have worked backwards, to the fact that if you fit the rank size rule, the, this is the existing one, to, um, uh, to the data and project backwards to look at the smallest cities, there is 1.64 million cities over 1,000 people. Now, it's very debatable whether a thousand people is a city, okay, you know, this is all the issue. But the critical issue is we do have some handle on what the future is going to be like if this rank size yeah. relationship remains stable. And it has remained stable for, there are many, many examples, I mean, Zip's law itself. So in some senses, we can hazard a guess at how many cities there'll be um, in, say, the year 2100. Mm on the assumption that the global population stabilizes to 10 billion and you know 95% of all moved yeah. to cities at that point we can work out well I've not worked it out but it's a back of an envelope type of calculation with all, all the assumptions so in some senses we've got that and the data is also showing that the biggest cities 
are not necessarily growing as fast as the smallest cities. In fact, Gibraltar law says that the smaller cities are growing faster, basically. Um, OK, there's more variation. More of them die, basically. So there are some very interesting questions you've raised here in that sense about how big is a city? Well, you, you yourself raise them in the sense of saying, how big yeah. will a city get? Will it go up and down? Yeah, in trouble. We don't know. <laughs> but we can kind of begin to think about that future, notwithstanding all these things. So do you want to speak first to the city size question yeah, and let, then let think about the policy implications? Well, but, but look, uh, uh, Michael, the, I think Art walked us through uh, the similar type of uh, uh, regularity yesterday. and said, gee, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, context doesn't work. It doesn't work in that case. And all I can say is that, well, this is a human, uh, uh, human beings are ones that establish this by their behavior. And there's always the opportunity for an unexpected flex point in processes where humans are involved. And when you start adding the kind of technologies we're seeing today, there may be an inflection point coming that actually, just think if there are five major uh, urban regions in the world, one on each continent, what do you think that, that rank size rule is gonna look like? They're gonna be five big things, and then maybe it'll drop off to very small places almost immediately. All I'm saying is that there, there are some questions here about what the future holds for us as our we move into an entirely different era with technologically enhancement of human capability, but maybe not modifying its intentionality. I think, I think the biggest thing you said was that the, 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 the biggest, biggest thing that undermines what I said, or what many yeah. people have said, okay. is that is this fusion notion, the, the fact that cities fuse in yeah. some sense, uh -huh. and then the whole notion of the city is up for grabs, what is it physically, and so, and so on. So, so, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. I, I think the uh, map we saw yesterday of Pac cities in Pakistan and, and uh, uh, India, you see them starting off with Delhi and then just going into a big arc and coming around through, uh, uh, never remember the name of that one, but eventually down to Karachi and that all at least is urbanized, if not more so than the Northeast Corridor is, which is one that has a lot of urbanization in many places, so, yeah. And to Kyle's question about policy responses, what should government uh, do? Well, you know, we haven't seen much uh, uh, good fortune at the national level to limit the uh, uh, metropolitan size and scale. I think, I go back to Peter's example, and I gotta go back to Calcutta, I haven't been there for 10 years. I, I, I'll believe this when I see it. Peter, that you have a city that's had uh, Communist Party rule for 19 years, which means you got a strong central government. Maybe they have the enforcement capability to make uh, these kind of changes and actually influence the outcomes. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't have much to say about that other than uh, you probably have to continue to have some kind of a, a process you go through where the hordes that come in faster than you can supply uh, support systems, uh, how you manage those in some fashion. Uh, it's gonna take a lot more resource focus on those sort of things if you want to slow down those really rapid urbanization processes that we see in many developing countries. And uh, uh, I think this is a, a great a question for the World Bank <laughs> representative here to, to advise us on a bit later. But uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, okay. colleagues. Thank you.